this is SSI. And as you can see, the reference of food is inescapable, and that's why it's still referred to as a kitchen of Japan. Over the centuries, Osaka, a major trading port, was a main supplier of food throughout the country. Today, it is still the culinary capital of Japan. And that's why we decided to make it our first stop on this food tour across the country. I'm David Saldran. This is Executive Class. The sights, the sounds, the smells. In Osaka, it's all about food. The Osaka's appetite for eating is matched only by an appetite for making money. Unlike Imperial Kyoto or the official capital Tokyo, Osaka has and continues to be a city of merchants. It's the commercial heart of Japan. The Osaka Castle is more than just a landmark. It's a towering reminder of the city's importance. The enormous castle was built by Toyotomi Hideyoshi, the shogun that united Japan in the 16th century. Back then, Osaka, not Tokyo, was the political center of Japan. That changed after the Tokugawa warlord clan overran the castle and defeated Hideyoshi's heirs and moved the capital to Edo, or modern-day Tokyo. <laughs> Just like the old days, huh? And of course, what's a warrior without his sword? Not shot. Not shot. Today, it's possible to relive the great samurai battles of the time. One of the things you can do at the castle is try on replica helmets of famous warriors and shogun. This one I'm wearing was a helmet of the original resident of this castle, Hideyoshi. The unusual shape of the helmet was meant to help warriors identify their leaders in the battlefield. With the shoguns moving out to Tokyo, Osaka merchants went on to do what they always did best. Making money and spending it on, well, food. Lively and noisy Dotonburi Road is where you'll find the best choices. Many of the shops here have been serving their own specialties for centuries. Down to earth, that's how the locals of Osaka are often described. And that includes their food. That's why no trip to Osaka is complete without trying their popular street food, starting with takoyaki bar. Yeah, hello, hello. <laughs> we got a line up here. Takoyaki balls, bite sized grilled octopus dumplings, were said to have evolved from these savory cakes served in the tea ceremonies of Osaka in the 17th century. Today's version is more of a midday snack, especially popular with the young. At Kukuru along Dotonburi, people willingly line up in the rain for a taste of their best selling takoyaki. Takoyaki is offered in street stalls all over Osaka. But they say some of the best are made here. Let's find out from Nishimura san what makes this differ from the rest. She says she uses white wine to help make it soft and gooey. And the octopus slice they put in it is bigger than usual. Now let's see why the Osakans love it. Ah, here it is, the takoyaki balls. Takoyaki bowls are street food and they're better eaten on the street, but because it's raining outside, we're eating it indoors. 
The manager, Fukuda Nishimura, teaches me the proper way of enjoying takoyaki. With chopsticks so the balls don't fall apart, and with a generous serving of mayonnaise, bonito flakes, and seaweed powder all gulped down in one go. Ah, okay. And one, all at once or one bite? All at once. Ah, all at once. Oh, okay. Oh, boy. Because of the working class character of Osaka, you find street food everywhere. Now we're told to check out this shop over here because they have what they call the best kushikatsu in town. Let's check it out. For over 80 years now, Daruma has been serving kushikatsu, or deep fried meat, fish and vegetable skewers, which they say they invented. It's another Osaka original. And we just had to try it. Yeah. Ah, Arigato. This is Mr. Sasabe. He's a shop manager, and his staff has prepared for me an assortment of kushi katsu, right? That's a uh, skewered and fried. It looks very simple on the outside, but it's extremely tasty. I want to know why this is so tasty. What's the secret? Sasabe-san tells me it's all in a dipping sauce, a secret recipe he can't reveal. But it also has to do with the sheer simplicity of the recipe. Fresh ingredients that are dipped in batter, then covered in crumbs, and fried in oil. Pretty much anything can be cooked, shrimp, asparagus, chicken, and our bestseller beef. In unpretentious Osaka, anything goes except for one important rule. You have to remember, no double dipping, meaning you want to dip it in the sauce, can't put it back for hygienic reasons. Japanese food is relatively expensive. But the great thing about Osaka is, you can find good food that's affordable. In fact, the best food is often found in simple stalls like these. Okonomiyaki, an Osakan savory pancake, is typical of the city's cuisine and of Osaka itself. Rough in the edges, but once you try it, entirely enjoyable. Osakans love food so much they'll literally risk their lives for a taste of the forbidden. Now this here is a special treat. This fish over here is what you call blowfish or in Japanese fugu. It's poisonous they say, but in the hands of a talented chef, you can actually eat and enjoy it. It's supposed to be very good and very expensive. The lethal poison of the fugu is locked inside a fish so it's safe to hold, but not to cut open or eat, unless you're trained to do so. Hiro no Ipponzuri, an izakaya near Dotonburi, is one of those licensed by the government to serve fugu. We've been to many izakayas before, but this is my first time to try one where you actually have to fish for your own dinner. Let's try the blowfish. This is as close as you get to the fugu. The dangerous business of slicing it open is left to Chef Tokunaga. Because many have died before, the government regulates the sale and preparation of fugu. A licensed chef like Tokunaga would have the skill to identify and remove the toxic parts. It's a matter of life and death. 
and even small traces of poison can paralyze both the chef and the diner. The parts that he's throwing away are so toxic that government regulates how those parts are actually discarded with. That's how poisonous this thing is. Fugu is served many ways. Though sashimi style is best to appreciate its taste, but also the most risky. Before ordering the fugu, I made sure that no other person has actually died from eating it in this restaurant. Of course, it's always the first time, but well, if it's gonna be my last meal, it better be the best. Fugu has a delicate umami taste and crunchy feel to it, not unlike any I've tasted. The risk of dying always adds that extra dimension to the meal. And pairing it with warm sake soothes the nerves. Now the good news is I've survived the first course. Now, fugu is prepared four ways. And the second course is now deep fried fugu fish meat. Let's try it. Fugu is the world's most expensive fish, so it makes sense to consume every edible part of it. Another way of cooking fugu is in a stew of fresh vegetables, shabu shabu style. The light taste of the fish matches well with the veggies and it's popular during the cold months. Though a few incidents of poisoning still occur, none have been reported in licensed restaurants. So like these photos of previous customers, you shouldn't worry. No, this is not my obituary. This is actually a wall for survivors. And I'm proud to say, executive class has survived this interesting adventure. Our food tour of the Kansai region continues after the break. From Osaka, we travel to nearby Kyoto to try temple cuisine. And then on to Kobe for a taste of their legendary beef. Osaka may be Japan's kitchen indeed, but it's not the only city in Kansai with a popular culinary tradition. Although just about an hour away from Osaka, Kyoto may very well be a world away. Kyoto's temples, gardens, and genteel ways are in stark contrast to Osaka's hustle-bustle 24-7 lifestyle. The contrast is most evident in food. In Kyoto, everything seems so much more refined and so much more adapted to the Zen Buddhist way of life. This is the essence of Kyoyori, Kyoto's cuisine. Kyoyori is best represented by temple food which in Zen Buddhism often means simple vegetarian fare. Even the elaborate kaiseki meals originally developed for the city's aristocrats still put vegetables at the center. To get an idea of how important vegetables are to Kyoto cuisine, head to the ancient Nishiki market, where a mind-blowing array of fresh produce is on display. Landlocked Kyoto didn't have any choice. Seafood was too difficult to source, and meat was frowned upon by Buddhist culture. At the market, you can sample Kyoto specialties like pickled vegetables, which are prized all over Japan for their natural sweetness. And 
freshly brewed matcha or green tea. But it's for unique vegetables like these that the city's best chefs come here for. One of the secrets behind Kyoto's popular cuisine is the freshness of its vegetables. At the Nishiki market, you'll find some really unusual ones like this very red carrot or this giant daikon or what we call radish. Awamasa, established in 1923, sources these larger than usual vegetables in the Kyoto countryside. They're not only bigger, owner Nogawa-san tells me, but they also taste different, better. It's a reason why food in Kyoto is so hard to replicate elsewhere. These vegetables are also up to 10 times the price of ordinary ones, and are only used in top restaurants or special occasions. You'll need to go to a traditional restaurant to know what these taste like. Yaosada, housed in a traditional Kyomachia townhouse, has been in business for over 100 years. Itadakimasu. You'll be hearing a lot of that in Japan. Basically, it means let me eat. It's how every meal begins. And what we're having today is chirashi zushi. It's served in many parts of the country, but in Kyoto, it's done differently and always with their special vegetables. Let's try it. This is a typical bento kaiseki meal. Small dishes served in separate sets of traditional lacquerware. Naturally, there's fresh vegetables in every dish. Sadatoshi Sasaki, the third generation owner, explains the fresh local vegetables we saw at the market are what give his dishes their unique flavor and texture. Kyoyori can be as simple as a bento lunch like this, or as grand as a 16-dish full-on kaiseki meal. But no matter the size or the price, Kyoto's low-fat and low-sodium cuisine is precisely what it is because of its local vegetables. All these healthy greens may make you crave for a fat slab of meat. So we're on our way to nearby Kobe, home of the famous black wagyu breed, sought by steak connoisseurs the world over. For those not familiar with Kobe beef, the coastal city of Kansai is remembered more for the earthquake that destroyed the city in January 1995. When the earthquake struck early in the morning, this elevated skyway collapsed completely. It was this famous image broadcast all over the world that symbolized the destruction of Kobe City. The city, like the elevated highway, has been entirely rebuilt. The view of the Kobe skyline from the port shows a city that has fully recovered from one of the worst natural disasters in the world. You can't help but pay tribute to the spirit and resolve of the Japanese people. Two months after the devastating earthquake, parts of the port were already reopened in only a few years for the entire city to be rebuilt. They've kept a small part of the wreckage, though, as proof and evidence of that episode in their history. More than 6,000 perished in the earthquake, most from eastern Kobe, for whom this memorial park was dedicated by Empress Michiko herself. In this memorial, the Empress Michiko dedicates a poem or haiku to the city of Kobe. Basically, she's saying, too many tears have been shed, only smiles are left. It's beautiful.
It's true that citizens of Kobe now prefer to look towards the future and learn from the lessons of the tragedy. Kobe today is at the forefront of research and education in disaster mitigation. The Disaster Reduction and Human Renovation Institute itself is a showcase of advances in earthquake-proof architecture with a museum that recreates a temblor that shook the city. If you're in Kobe on the morning of January 17, 1995, this was a scene that you would have woken up to. It's unbelievable destruction. Survivor Hirotoda Nambu still recalls the shock and hardship of the quake's aftermath. And how difficult was it after the earthquake? Did you have water? Did you have no, power? No power, no water, uh, no gas. Very cold, cold season. It was winter? Yes, yes, yeah. January 17th, coldest season in Japan. Hirotoda San's stories and the museum's exhibits were so fascinating, we almost forgot why we were in Kobe in the first place. That's right, food. It won't take long before you smell the scent of something baking. Kobe, they say, is where you'll find some of the best baked products and bread in all of Japan. There's a reason for this. The old port was where many of the chefs and bakers from Europe first established themselves and introduced their recipes in Japan. This is great. The basement of Kobe's department stores give you a sample of what the city has to offer. In fact, many of the products now popular in Japan originated in Kobe. And now for the ultimate gastronomic experience in Kobe, what else? Kobe beef. We're here at State Lando, and we're told they offer the best beef at the best price. Let's find out. Generic as Steakland may sound, there's nothing ordinary about the steak offered here. As the award show, the restaurant sources its meat from the best Kobe beef suppliers. And while there are fancier places in the city, few offer better value for money. A sirloin steak course costs 5,500 yen, a third less compared to other places. Now, while Hashimoto-san is preparing the tepan to cook the steak, we're going to ask yes. Monita-san here, who handles English-speaking guests, whether Kobe beef is really from Kobe. Yes, it comes from Tajima. Kobe. It's very yes. near Kobe. Yes. And is it true, Monita-san, that yes. the reason why it's so soft and juicy is because the cows are fed beer? Yeah. And they're massaged? Is that true? Oh, yes. Some farmers um, oh. feed beers. Yeah, it's true. Kobe beef is a local variety of beef from the black wagyu cow originally bred in Japan. Spoiled and fattened, the cows are kept in pens to reduce activity and stress to help enhance marbled fat. Kobe city itself does not produce beef but it's a term given to the meat of the Tajima strain of cows of Hyoga Prefecture, which are prized for their high degree of marbling. Well, I understand, Morita-san, that the most popular, the most famous uh, beef cut is a sirloin, right? Yes, sirloin. Why, why do the Japanese like that? Oh, because um, the burns of beef and fat. Ah, yes. well, you know, that's the reason why I love sirloin yes. as well, especially for Wagyu. Yes. Wagyu is up to 25% marbled fat, and this is what makes the meat so tender and full of flavor. 
This sirloin cut is grade A57, not the highest in marbling, but the optimum ratio of meat to fat. To get the most taste out of the beef, the Japanese like theirs cooked medium rare, with garlic chips, butter, white wine, salt and pepper, and vegetables on the side. An experienced chef knows exactly when to flip the steak and slices it further to sear all sides. On the surface, this might look like it's a little overcooked, but there's a reason for this. It's a way of keeping all those juices locked inside. I bet once I bite into this, it's really pink inside. Mm. Told you so. So this is what people have been raving about. Original Kobe beef. So tender, it melts in your mouth. Leaving a silky finish that's simply indescribable. The cities of Kobe, Kyoto, and Osaka in Japan's Kansai region share a similar passion for food. Although expressed in different ways, the Osakans for the tasty and down to earth, the Kyotoites for the subtle and refined. and those from Kobe with their penchant for the exotic and international. All give us a taste of the essence of Japanese cuisine, where quality is prized above all else. And that's all for this episode of Executive Class. I'm David Saldran. Thanks for watching.